Hey everybody, you're listening to the We Are Rising podcast. This is your host, Andrew Benjamin, and I am joined by a very special guest today. With us, we have Pride Resurrection, who operates the awesome Pride Resurrection YouTube channel, where you can find old Pride shows, the weirdest of MMA shit that you never knew existed, and also, uh, Project Resurrection, he also commentates on the show. And actually, is a very good commentator. And uh, most dangerous man alive, Project Resurrection, whatever name you go by, I appreciate you talking to us, say. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for, thanks for giving me a shout-out. Uh, uh, we uh, There we do weird stuff in the annals of MMA history. <laughs> That's what I like to say. So, oh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got uh, into MMA fandom. So it probably started in 2005, maybe late 2005, early 2006, when just by happen chance, I was bored and probably browsing a torrent site and saw that they had uploaded a UFC. And I had watched UFC, or I'd seen like maybe UFC 2 back in like 1993 and as a kid. And I kind of knew about it, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And at the time, it was co- sort of considered a crazy uh, spectacle. And so all through the 90s, didn't really care, was a kid involved with video games. Uh, and then so in 2006, I downloaded, I think it was, I want to say it was UFC 66. And it had Matt Hughes defending his title. I also had Rich Franklin on it. And I watched that and I was like hooked because it was so different from what I remember. The grungy, bloody, ugly UFC 2. And from then on, I I just started uh, getting them all. Got into Pride around 2007. A little late at that time, Pride was closing up shop. Uh, I remember watching a Mark Coleman promo where he had broken uh, Shogun, who was an arm, and that was like posted on, at the time it might have been MySpace. It was somewhere it was posted on, and I was watching it. I'm like, whoa, what's this? i never uh, seen this before. And it was, you know, I seen it was Pride in Japan. And then after that, I had went and uh, found uh, the entire collection of Pride, uh, binge watched it over a weekend. And yeah, I, w- I would say that was that. Was that. So, uh, yeah, you said you got into Pride a little bit late. Uh, did you, how did you, uh, uh, watch uh, Pride uh, after the fact. Uh, did, were you doing the tra- tape trading, or were you going on LimeWire, or the uh, torrent sites, YouTube? How did, yeah, how- it, it would have been... A, it, I had found an entire torrent that had Pride... From the Grand Prix, then it had Pride 1 through 8. It had uh, started with the Grand Prix all the way to the end. And so that was the collection I had downloaded, and that was what I had been binge-watched over that weekend. And how did, so tell us the uh, culmination of the Pride Resurrection YouTube channel. Uh, when did you conceive this idea? And uh, yeah, just tell us how, how you conceived the idea of this uh, YouTube channel. So like many of people, I was, uh, I'm an avid YouTuber watching YouTube. And I was inspired by several channels, I guess you could say. I was inspired by like the gaming historian and Red Letter Media and even to an extent uh, OSW. Uh, old school wrestling reviews and just looking on YouTube I had seen there is not a whole lot of stuff on pride there was not a lot of reminiscing or lookbacks or reviews and stuff like that and so I said huh you know that's that could be we could capture the market on this we could be the only channel on YouTube that's doing pride reviews in English now search maybe there's it's different for like Russian or Japanese but uh, yeah we cornered the market on pride reviews and uh, the, the views haven't been great. <laughs> I would say it's a very, uh, you know, niche, uh, market, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're it. We're the home for, for, for pride reviews. And also now as, uh, I've expanded sort of the video to include more Japanese MMA, Japanese wrestling and odd stuff that, I, that I'll find that has been showcased before. So I got to ask, I, I don't know if it can divulge, uh, but, where do you get your stash from? Is this stuff that you have, uh, uh, say, on a hard drive somewhere? Or is there just a case where you know a guy who knows a guy uh, who has this stuff? So right now I do have a large stash, but I 
build my stash from there was a um, there was a Russian forum. Uh, it's like a and it's a torrent tracker. And somebody was spreading around a list on there for uh, all these uh, Mega Dot NZ uh, folders, and they were just filled with MMA current MMA. Uh, MMA from the 2000s, just uh, endless, endless drives. And so I, I spent some time to go through the entire list, kind of mapped out what was in each drive and got the stuff that I was most interested in, which would have been stuff from the late 90s, early 2000s, odd stuff that I'd never seen before uh, or was interested in checking out. And yeah, so that kind of helped my collection right there. That the Russian master list, which is kind of a little bit defunct now, because somebody recently, I would say a couple months ago, somebody was going in and purging all the drives of everything that was on there. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So I gotta ask as well. Um, I uh, you probably for those that don't know, is owned by UFC Zufa Endeavor, whatever company owns it. Have you YouTube has, is notorious because of its draconian copyright laws. Are you, have you, has the channel ever gotten any strikes or been victim of the uh, YouTube copyright system yet? Yeah, yeah. In fact, just a couple days ago, I was face down. I guess YouTube has a new method now <clears throat> um, where if a strike is impending because you dispute it or you send like a counter-strike notification and you want to appeal their strike, they'll... Uh, They'll send you a seven-day takedown notice saying, in seven days, if you don't cancel your appeal, you're going to get a strike. So what's the whole point of the appeal if they can just take it down anyway? I, I don't get it. I don't know what it is. But yeah, uh, UFC is um, uh, quite st stringent, even if it's legitimate fair use where it's transformative it's commentary it's review it's educational and that's everything you could say about our episodes on pride is we provide the context of the fighters what happened at the fight there's comedy bits it's completely fair use but it doesn't matter like uh we have absolutely no say whatsoever in whether ufc can take down our content and we can't even appeal uh they will just reject the appeal, and there's nothing we can do. We can't even submit a um, a counterclaim or a counter notification, whatever it is, because they say we don't have the basis or the legitimate standing to uh, the legal right. They said so. The YouTube's own system of copyright, uh, they don't enforce it on an equal level. For a small channel like us, we don't even get a chance to dispute it. Do you happen to? Uh, I don't know if do you use any alternate websites in case uh, if they have ch channels ever taken down that you just upload like uh, Vimeo or something like that. Yeah, so BitChute, we do have a channel up on BitChute, and most of the stuff is on there. Uh, but I think I still have to fill the gaps a little bit. Uh, I had went and downloaded. Uh, uh, I went and downloaded all of the content that we had uploaded because I didn't necessarily save all the original editing projects you know the clear out space and and to keep my drive tidy so i went and uh pulled the, all the stuff that we had on youtube down into a, a f backup so yeah bit shoot we're on there and uh if our channel does ever go down which you never know it might because we were we were pulled down uh i don't know what was the story behind it why but we were flagged for sexually explicit material now, I disputed that, and our channel was reinstated, but the problem was that from that moment on, it's been nothing but a constant struggle trying to reach the previous highs that we had hit. Every video we released, uh, in terms of like the Pride Resurrection stuff, it was a new high. New high in viewership, new high in watch time, new high in subscribers. And then that uh, takedown or that uh, ban of our channel pretty much drew... Uh, not only took out our momentum, but I think it put us into that scary place of YouTube where we're kind of not findable to the average person. Like we don't appear in recommended videos and stuff like that. Before then, we had no problem. But after that, uh, whoever initiated that, whether it was an automatic process for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, or if somebody had flagged our channel as a means to, you know, to, to kind of troll us or, or hurt us, whatever. 
it did. It did really bad damage to the channel, and it's been hard to try and recover from that. Uh, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> you know, still I'm working on a new Pride Resurrection right now, and uh, it should be a whole lot of fun. I can actually tell you uh, from people, from other people who use YouTube that I know, that if you do get a warning, even if you successfully appeal it, it totally fucks with the algorithm. So basically, yeah. so basically, yeah, yeah you, you're 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 not wrong in in what you're saying. No doubt, it, that's why it's not put, uh, picking up in the recommended. So like, you would literally have to. Uh, Look up Pride Resurrection on the on the search bar to find you yeah. at the point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the YouTube channel, and I want to talk about my probably my favorite subject that you that you guys do the MMA oddities, where you have yeah. everything from like pro wrestlers, luchadors doing MMA, and just like it's like the grimy, dirty side of MMA that I I I kind it's it's the it's I miss it. Uh, just because of every, it's it's so sports like that you kind of miss the old days where you just you had two fat guys or two Mexican luchadors or Mexican luchador versus Minoru Suzuki, and it just you know there there was something there's something very appealing about that. I have no idea why. So I just w tell us how like what how when you decided to do MMA Audi is like what what was the thought process behind starting that starting up that series. Well, I just wanted to kind of highlight the weird one-off fights that had filled the history of MMA. Uh, yeah, like you had said, a luchador fighting Minoru Suzuki, and he low blows his way out of the match. You know, it's like he has, he doesn't stand a chance against Minoru Suzuki, and he finds his way out by kneeing Minoru Suzuki in the junk. Uh, just, I love that stuff. Not only is it funny, but just interesting and and you know fun to watch and i think mma now love it or hate it it has become very streamlined uh down to how guys train how guys eat uh a lot of it is sort of almost interchangeable guys like it doesn't matter who you put in there they're almost the same fighter and i think what ufc has done to sort of streamline mma uh, what they've done is they they've kind of taken out the spectacle from it. Uh, save, save for a couple every now and then you'll have a superstar like Conor McGregor fight, and that's still a spectacle. But I think UFC's attempts to make it a a league like the NBA or something like that, where everything has to be controlled, what the guys wear, how the you know how they look. Uh, all that stuff is a detriment to the sport in the fact that they're taking away the personality and character and individuality of the fighters in an attempt to make it a more streamlined, legitimate, you know, professional sport. I think that's a mistake. Uh, they MMA, in my opinion, was so much better in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, maybe it wasn't. Um, there were some elements to it that were questionable. And you didn't have the best level of talent, but I think the matchups and the styles and there was, it was almost chaotic, but the uncertainty of it was what was appealing, you know, so you could have that luchador versus, um, you know, Minoru Suzuki. And then they try, you know, they were trying to do something like that today. You have the CM Punk versus, uh, I can't even remember who CM Punk fought, <laughs> but even then, if CM Punk wasn't coming in and being CM Punk. He was just being your run-of-the-mill MMA fighter who really didn't have any reason to be in the ring. Now, if CM Punk would have come in and he's dressed like CM Punk and he does the CM Punk stuff, I, that would be awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I, you bring up a great point because without you, I wouldn't have discovered fighters like Osamu Kawahara, who might be oh, legitimately yeah. the worst... MMA fighter of all time. Pachikari. Uh, Pachikari was his wrestling name. He had uh, lightning bolts on his singlet. And he fought Gary Goodridge once at Pride in the Pride 2000 Grand Prix. And he was quickly uh, dismantled by Gary Goodridge. Uh, he had no business being in the ring with Gary Goodridge. Uh, why they, they matched him up with Gary Goodridge, I have no idea. But Gary Goodridge crushed him. And then he fought... Another time, I, I think I covered it. It was in, uh, I want to say it was in deep, it was in the deep promotion, which was sort of a 
while Pride was going on, Deep was built as sort of a minor league sort of promotion for Pride that Pride would use for talent. Uh, that changed, but yeah, he appeared at a, a Deep and he wasn't any better against, I can't even remember who he fought, but it was uh, not good. Uh, wasn't that the El Connect match? I actually just, I think I... Yeah, that, yeah that's right. Yeah, he did, yeah, he also fought a luchador. Uh, and El Canac, uh I think El Canac won that one. It yes, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a travesty. <laughs> so it sounds like you're also a pro wrestling fan, or at least were at some point. Uh, do you keep... Yeah, I, I still am, though I don't really watch, I would say I don't really watch MM, or uh, UFC, uh, not UFC, uh, WWE that much nowadays. Uh, but yeah, I was a big, I grew up on, in my teens, when, during the Attitude Era, I was big on, uh, me and my dad used to watch it, we started watching WCW with the NWO, then we switched over to w, uh, WWF, but I had, you know, as a kid, I had watched, obviously, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage, and that was in the, the late 80s, so I was absolutely a, a fan of uh, wrestling, but fell out of it until the Attitude Era, and then after the Attitude Era, and I, you know, became uh, an adult, mm -hmm. I started drinking and getting interested in women. <laughs> yeah, that kind of went the, uh, to the uh, side there. But you also have a knowledge of pure wrestling, Japanese pro wrestling as well. Or do you keep up with, uh, like, New Japan or All Japan now? Or is it just something you just casually pay attention to? Yeah, no, not, not current day stuff. Although I will... Uh, every now and then maybe watch the new kingdom that they come out. I got into Japanese pro wrestling just out of a necessity out of all the Japanese pro wrestlers that were appearing in pride. And I had to do research on them and find out who they were. And just from that necessity, I kind of started getting into it and having uh, a curiosity, but also an appreciation for Japanese pro wrestling. And so we have done some Japanese pro wrestling stuff on uh, on the channel. And we have done videos that have been dedicated to Japanese pro wrestling. Or, you know, shoe style pro wrestling, which was a thing in Japan from 1983 until 19... Well, there, there might be some form of shoe wrestling still going on now. But the thing behind shoe wrestling, shoe style wrestling, was that it was MMA just with predetermined results. So it looked like your your typical MMA match with, with ground fighting, some stand-up kickboxing, but it was all predetermined. And I would say that would probably be a big catalyst for MMA worldwide, but specifically in Japan, because Pancrase came from shoot style. And Pancrase was, for the most part, a legitimate promotion. There was the odd work maybe thrown into pancreas uh some people will say there was more works than there was legitimate fights but i think that it was a more of a uh, legitimate shoot than the work side but japanese mma definitely was birthed from shoot style pro wrestling and I, you know that was something i learned along the way doing my start doing pride resurrection was researching the fighters who were appearing and, and doing stories on their history where they came from what they did uh, so, yeah. So, um, out of all the MMA oddities things that you have watched, which was the one that you just said, I cannot believe that this match actually happened in some arena? Uh, so that would have to be probably... Number one would have to be Kimo versus Sakuraba. Uh, and the only reason for that is because the last two fighters that I would ever have expected to you know fight would be chemo in his glory days if he ever had glory days those were it 1996 you know 1995 96 97 chemo versus sakuraba and probably like the elk knack versus um osamu just because osamu was so horrible and I got to get my names right because I think I said Osamu fought Gary Gurja. I don't think he did. I'm, th I'm thinking of Tachikori, uh, and I would have to look real quick here to, to uh, get my facts straight because uh, I have just a jumble mess in my head of, <laughs> of Japanese pro wrestlers that um, I might th be thinking of Soichi. 
uh, who was just a fat, disgusting, worthless guy who fought Ensign Inoue at Pride 5. And he would later fight, I think I do have one where he fights uh, an MMA oddity. He fights Giant Ochai, another Japanese, I don't think he did rest, pro wrestling, but he was a rising star in Japanese MMA. The most ridiculous thing you've ever seen, uh, Soichi is covered with Yakuza tattoos. He is the most disgusting looking man you've ever fought. And uh giant ochai uh destroys him uh, but but not before soichi kisses him before the fight <laughs> it is um yeah that would be one of them and also i would say uh, uh, some of the other stuff that you can't believe happened would be joe san fighting at pride the best uh volume one and then i think he fought again at pride the best volume two you could tell that that guy was just dripping with mental disease and uh, something was going to come to That was to the head. one he came out in the loincloth or at the speedo? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, it was like a speedo loincloth and he had it pulled into his ass, like gave himself an intentional wedgie. Uh, you could see his cup, uh, like his jock strap beneath was not even covered at all. Uh, and he he doesn't even fight. Like, the guy takes him down, and he taps out immediately. It, and it's like, oh, <laughs> this is the one where, he, or like, it, like on Wikipedia, it lists tap out as like, by, like, fear or something. Yeah, 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 something ridiculous like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, oh, God. Uh, but actually, so let's move on to the Pride of videos, uh, speaking of Pride, because, uh, well, I want to know uh, commentary. So you provide sole commentary on these shows. To, uh, what made you want to start commentating over the shows rather than, you know, just, I mean, was, was that a uh, fair use thing that, that, that you decided? Yeah, yeah, it was a fair use thing. And, and also I had wanted to, I was really interested in the, the history aspect of the fighters, like where they came from, where they would go. Uh, what would happen with them? Uh, so th when I started doing it, it was it was heavily influenced by a want to cover the histories of the fighters, cover the history of the sport, where the sport was going at the time, uh, what was going on in uh, the world of MMA. So I, and I started, and it, it's a duo here. We have we have two, uh, though lately it's been just me. But that uh, will kind of change. Um, you know, going forward, we'll, we're going to try and mix it up, just time constraints and location and stuff like that. But it's uh, me and the Colombian Good Vibe, and the Colombian Good Vibe has been there since the beginning. Uh, we did uh, Pride One together, and there's only been a couple times where he hasn't been available to do it. Uh, this next episode coming out, I couldn't get him uh, av available to do it, but I we have a surprise. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything uh, for any avid fans of Pride Resurrection. Uh, you'll just have to watch the full episode when it's completed. <laughs> but we do have something in the works there. So, uh, so, so yeah, it's a two-man group. Mm -hmm. It's a two-man two group, uh, me and uh, the Colombian Good Vibe, though. He doesn't do really any of the offshoot videos like the MMA oddities or the classic MMA revival. Uh, that would be all stuff that's uh, that's my interest. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we do have two questions uh, on social media regarding mm -hmm. uh, Pride. Um, well, the first question is from the Downturn Podcast at Downturn. Let me just make sure I get their handle right. Uh, at Downturn the, they say top, oh, they ask top three fighters of your uh, top three fighters who never fought in Pride. So. I would have to limit that question to the time that Pride was in existence. You know, like you could say, oh, you know, Conor McGregor or John Jones. Uh, I'll limit it to yeah. the time that Pride was in existence. So with that in mind, the, the top three fighters that never fought in Pride but wish they would have fought in Pride would be Randy Couture. Come on, him versus Fedor would have been uh, <laughs> like the match of uh, the century. Uh, so Randy Couture, Matt Hughes. Uh, and interesting about both Matt Hughes and Randy Couture, they both fought in Japan. They both fought for rings. Uh, Randy Couture was in the King of Kings 2000 tournament uh, for rings, made it to the semifinals, I believe. Uh, and Matt Hughes fought for rings at their 10th anniversary show. Uh, but they never, they never fought in Pride. I know Matt Hughes was announced to fight in a Pride show that after UFC 
had bought Pride. They had announced that he would fight for the uh, Pride middleweight title. Of course, that uh, never happened, or the welterweight title, but that never happened uh, because that show was quickly canceled once UFC could work with the Japanese. The Japanese weren't willing to do anything to, to help out or get a, um, an, an arena scheduled or anything like that. So Randy Couture, Matt Hughes, and Tito Ortiz. Uh, Chuck Liddell had fought in Pride. I believe he, uh, uh, off the top of my head, he, I, he fought for once. Uh, he fought once. I think he might fight again, but uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, so, yeah, that would be the top three right there. And the other question is, uh, it is technically Pride related because he did a uh, fight in Pride. Uh, the first Pride, actually. Uh, why do you hate our glorious overword, Nobuhiko Takata, so much? Yes, so, uh, Nobuhiko Takata, I... I I hate him, but I can appreciate his what he did for Japanese MMA and Japanese pro wrestling. But, but he is a he is a loathsome person. <laughs> he is uh, if you want to know like one of the reasons why I hate Takata so much is just the way he treated. So they had the Takata Dojo, and the Takata Dojo was a pro wrestling dojo, but also list you know was as like a shoot style legitimate dojo, and anybody that had signed up. Uh, to fight in the Takata Dojo or fight and train at the Takata Dojo and then eventually have real fights, they would give their entire purse, uh, whatever money that they were slated to get from fighting, would go to Takata and he paid a salary every month. Now, that's that's great, but when you're Sakuraba and you're a part of the Takata Dojo and you're fighting at the top of the card, you should be getting paid. He probably was getting paid a, a hundred grand plus easily, maybe 200 grand when he fought Vanderlei Silva the first time. All that money goes to Takata. Takata gives him like a, a three thousand yen salary. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, that was that's a sticking point behind their relationship. I think they had a fractured relationship because Sakuraba was a disciple of Takata. T- uh, Takata had trained him to, uh, to be a pro wrestler, had gave him obviously opportunities of fighting Pride at you know Pride Two, and that was uh, Takata has a, a very sordid history with Pride Rose or with Pride uh, fighting championships. He was one of the co-founders of it. He was like an executive producer and all this stuff. So he had a lot of sway and he always put his guys in shows, whether they belong there or not, not including Sakuraba. Obviously Sakuraba was a great talent, but guys like Yuhi Sano, who was just one of his pro wrestling buddies and shoot style buddies uh, who couldn't, be any worse of a fighter (laughs) Uh, so yeah Takata just his business practices and just uh, it was probably arrogant and ego and him booking himself to fight at Pride uh, Pride 3 he booked himself in a clear fixed fight he fought against the guy uh, who never fought before and oh my god I just had his name Um, Kyle Sturgeon guy never fought before comes in uh, d- uh, does a dive on it's so it's so clearly a fake fight, uh, but it's listed as a real fight. It's listed on Takata's pro record. Kyle Sturgeon disappeared into the wind, uh, was never seen again, uh, probably for good reason. Uh, and in fact, uh, the the next episode of Pride Resurrection, Takata fights for the last time in the Pride ring as a professional mixed martial artist. He fights Kiyoshi Tamura, another one of his disciples, in his farewell match. Uh, I think things don't go the way that they had planned. Oh, uh, uh, let me finish uh, finish this thought, and I gotta go uh, grab my uh, daughter real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, at Takata, just a, a, a kind of a bad fella, but he did a lot for Japanese combat sports. Uh, he was just he was a dick. He was just a mess of asshole. <laughs> and so, I just so want... uh, let me go. Yeah, go... uh, let me go. Grab my daughter, I'll be right back. And that, I just forgot to say, that question was from Gentleman's Combat at Gentleman's Comba, C-O-M-B-A. Oh, yeah, I actually, I want to talk about, you know, the whole Pride working matches, and that's because you recently posted a, uh, a clip from the Don Fry, um... Oh my God! Well, I'm forgetting the Japanese guy's name. Um, the uh, Don Fry's last match. That is uh, uh, Yoshida. Yoshida, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, where uh, the judo champ. Where uh, Yoshida gets a uh, uh, Fry an armbar, and it looks like the armbar is on for about maybe 25 seconds or something. But uh, in the in the clip you posted, 
you point to the referee who seems to be directing um, yeah, Yoshida. Yeah. I'm curious to know, are there any other matches that you, that, while we watching these things from Pride and all that stuff, that you that you think, hmm, maybe that match wasn't actually a, a real MMA match? So, other than the, uh, Takata versus Kyle Sturgeon, uh, you know, Pride had a specific way where they would kind of fix fights in a, you know, not an outward sort of, hey, you got to lose this way or, or whatnot. What they Pride would often do would be to change opponents on short notice on fighters or call up a fighter and give him a week notice to fight. Uh, something like that would be Amir Ranavardi when he fought Gary Goodrich a guy who he had uh, actually trained with and they called uh, Amir up on two day notes and said, Hey, you want to come to Japan and fight Gary Goodrich? He says, yes. And of course, Gary Goodrich just toys with him and then ends up demolishing him. And that, that was a fix in, in that way. Maybe the result was not determined, but it was, it was, that's how they, they set it up that way. So they would do that a lot. Pride would do that a lot. And there's many examples of them doing that. Another outward, word, uh, outright fix would be Takata versus Mark Coleman. Mark Coleman has kind of alluded to, he did what he had to do to take care of his family. And from my understanding is that Pride had offered Mark Coleman a, a contract and a guarantee of future fights if he would take a dive for Takata. And that happened at Pride Pride 5, I believe. It might have been Pride 6. Uh, no, Pride 6, Takata fought uh, Mark Kerr. Mark Kerr uh, destroyed him, which, again, I think it's a little fishy if you watch that fight. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to get off of the weeds here. Mark Coleman versus Takata is, is just a notorious uh, fix. It clearly is. Uh, Mark Coleman would, any day of the week, even on his worst day, break Nobuhiko Takata in half, and he succumbs to a heel hook of all things. Like it, it was, it's so bad. It was just awful. That's another reason why I, I don't like Takata, and I almost couldn't forgive Mark Coleman for that. But I, from what I understood, is that they promised that they'd give him more fights, and they uh, at the I think at the Pride 2000 GP, uh, Mark Coleman was in it, and he was given a pretty easy path. Uh, to victory. He fought Akira Soji. Akira Soji was about, I would say, 50 pounds lighter than him. Uh, Mark Coleman goes through him pretty easily. Uh, and then Mark Coleman ended up get, begin, uh, be getting a gift. He fought Alan Goa's... Uh, I don't want to get mixed up here, uh, so I'll just uh, I'll forget about that for a moment. But when he fought Fujita, Fujita had fought against Mark Kerr. Mark Kerr was really had a lot of things going on in his life at the time. And he ended up losing, uh, being pretty much exhausted and he lost the decision. Mm. Um, or it might've been a, a, a stoppage. Uh, I think it was a, a decision, but Fujita ended up getting hurt and his corner, when he went to fight Mark Coleman, his corner threw in a towel as soon as the bell rang. So Mark Coleman didn't even need to fight, uh, his semifinal opponent. Meanwhile, so Mark Coleman would go to the finals, and in the finals he was to face Igor Volchanchin, who had just got through fighting a 30-minute fight with Sakuraba in the semifinals. So Mark Coleman had like the easiest path in the 2000 Grand Prix. Uh, though they had set it up, Mark Coleman should have fought Mark Kerr if Fujita didn't shock the world, and that would have been a hell of a fight, I think, at that time. Uh, these two giant bulging muscly men who were actually friends and had trained together to fight for $250,000, I think would have been awesome. Now, while watching uh, all these pride shows for your channel, is there any show that just sticks out to you? It's like, wow, this show was freaking amazing. Well, obviously the, the 2000 Grand Prix, uh, the entirety of it, you watch the, the opening rounds and the finals that were split over two shows, but also Pride 10. I think Pride 10 was a monster of a show. It just uh, front to back, great finishes, a lot of great fights. And, you know, I think Bad Blood was also a good show. Pride 19 uh, was also a pretty good show. But uh, I would say so far in the uh in our timeline of Pride, we're going through a uh, chronological order. So we started with Pride 1, 
We're on Pride 23 now. Uh, it's been about 27 events. And in what we've seen so far, Pride 10 was by far the best show. I mean, it's just an awesome show. If, if uh, you're interested in, in MMA and you don't know a whole lot about Pride, you watch Pride 10, uh, it'll make you an instant fan. Great show. Now, you also on your channel, you all will have outside Pride shows. So, like, you have show, uh, shows from The Outsider. You have shows from Jungle Fights. Uh, I think I, uh, Deep and Pancreas I also saw. So, uh, oh, just uh, what about these other shows that you wanted to include them in your channel? What was the reason behind that? So, we'll take The Outsider. So, The Outsider was a promotion that was sort of the follow-up to the Rings Fighting, uh, Fighting Network Rings, which was created by Akira Maeda. In 1991, uh, the, wor uh, the combat sports world of Japan, I guess you could say, was splintered or fractured when Nobuhiko Takada, Akira Maeda, and uh, Fujiwara were who were like huge names in Japanese pro wrestling. They all sort of split off uh, from the company that they were working in together, which was, um, which was uh, was it the UWFI? The, the UW with the UWF, so the original Universal mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wrestling Federation. Uh, so they have UWF uh, Newborn, or it might have been called Reborn. Uh, but either either way, that promotion was closed up. And uh, the three big guys from that, Akira Maeda, Nobuhiko Takada, and Yoshiaki Fujiwara, they all went off to create their own promotions. Yoshiaki Fujiwara created uh, Fujiwara uh, Gumi, uh, Pro Wrestling Fujiwara Gumi, which had Ken Shamrock, uh, Minoru Suzuki, Masakazu Funaki, three guys who would eventually leave Fujiwara to go create Pancras, uh, and the rest is history. Uh, Takada had created the... You bumped your lip. Yes. Oh, no. Uh, Nobuhiko Takada would create the UWFI, which was the, what do you call that thing? Uh, I can't remember what it stands for, <laughs> but he created the UWFI. Uh, and Akira Maeda created Fighting Network Rings, which, Akira Maeda created Fighting Network Rings, which in the beginning from until about early 1998 was a shoot style promotion. So it was all 95% fake. Every now and then they would have a quote unquote legitimate shoot fight that had maybe a non predetermined result, uh, or the guys would go pretty heavy on each other, such as a, a rings event in 19, early 1998, maybe late 1997. Uh, after Frank Shamrock left Pancrase and he was sort of drifting in the wind, he came into rings and fought Shiyoshi Kosaka. And just watching that fight, you can tell, even if all the fights surrounding them were clearly kind of a work style uh you could tell that that uh frank shamrock and uh kosaka were going at each other really hard drawing blood and so that was that the odd non-worked -work fight in rings then in 1998 late 1998 mid 1998 maybe after akira Maeda retired uh he fought he and it's listed on both their pro records alexander carolyn uh russian wrestling god uh, where they went to a draw. It was a fake fight. <laughs> That's another oddity. If you want to watch a, a wrestling or a MMA oddity, that will stun you. And I, I was in disbelief the whole thing. I kind of made it, I kind of took the piss out of the whole fight. It was clearly a work. Uh, Carolyn sh should have broke Akira Maeda so many times. But anyway, uh, so Fighting Network Rings became a legit promotion in 1998. Uh, they would uh, grow some pretty awesome talent, such as Fedor. Fedor started in uh, Fighting Network Rings. Uh, Minotaro Noguera started there. Uh, Dan Henderson. So a lot of uh, guys that would eventually move over to Pride got started in Rings. And then Rings went belly up in early 2002. Uh, Pride was the promotion in Japan at the time. They were on top of the not only the Japanese... MMA world, but the entire world, they were number one, uh, UFC, it would take years and years before UFC finally caught up to them. Um, but in 1997, Akira May decided to come back and have like a sequel to rings, which was called the outsider. And I believe it was called rings, the outsider. And I, from what I've been able to take away, I don't understand Japanese, but watching these events, 
they were put together solely so Japanese biker gangs and members of the Yakuza and other street gangs in Japan could fight each other in a ring. <laughs> and there is no doubt that's what happens because they do backstories on the guys. They show them with their uh, biker gangs. Uh, they show them, they come in the ring, and they're covered in Yakuza tattoos. And they're some of the worst fights you've ever seen, but they're all, that also makes them so awesome <laughs> because they, they're so amateurish that it's just super entertaining. So, yeah, uh, The Outsider, I don't know how long they keep this uh, style going of pitting Japanese gangs against each other. I don't know if they're settling their differences, what the idea is behind it. I'm sure someone out there, a, a native of Japan, could probably fill me in on, on what the story is behind the promotion is. I'm just going off of an educated guess. Uh, so, yeah, The Outsider... That's why I decided to do that one, because after I saw the first one, I'm like, this this is some hot stuff. Imagine if they did this in America, where they did, like, bully beatdown, but they did, you know, the Crips and the blood settle their differences in the MMA ring. <laughs> Come on, that, that is... <laughs> oh, my God. That'd be great. Who yeah, who wouldn't want to watch that? That is something that, if, they, if somebody hears this and they decide to put that together... Uh, that's all right. I'll, I'll let him take the credit for that. <laughs> so what? Uh, what? Uh, what can? Uh, what future shows do you have planned for the channel? Uh, I'm, I'm working on episode 27 of Pride Resurrection right now, which will cover Pride 23. Going to have uh, a lot of fun stuff happen in that one. Uh, there's a preview up for that one on the channel right now. Uh, I'm going to be working on a sort of a, a shit posting video for kickboxer 2 the sequel the bad sequel to the jean-claude van damme uh, uh vehicle uh, kickboxer uh i'm gonna do that in a style of i just did a recent video called uh the most dangerous man alive today's dungeon where i sort of watch a silly pro wrestling or mma event and just take the piss out of it uh so i'm gonna do that uh, i'm gonna start working on that for kickboxer 2 that's that should be a whole lot of fun and then I'll probably get back to live streaming here, and we'll probably watch, I don't know, something like Smack Girl from 2001, which was a Japanese women-only MMA, and I use that term very loosely, MMA promotion, which I think it was actually more like pro wrestling based. I don't know how many how many of the fights in that promotion were ever real, but it's got like cute little Japanese girls in there. Most of them are cute. Some of them are, are <laughs> I, I wouldn't categorize as cute in a uh a typical way <laughs> some of them are pretty only but uh yeah i have i have a couple of those uh lying around that i might uh throw that up next for like a live stream and we could watch it all and and laugh that that typically what what i'm out for is finding not not videos that are great mma but are stuff that are entertaining in other ways do you, now, do you keep up with Ryzen or any JMMA uh, that's, pr that's on presently? No, no, and just uh, sort of casually uh, now. I've actually really been strictly classic MMA, classic pro wrestling stuff, uh, Japanese like affair uh, lately, though I still obviously follow the news, uh, keep my ears open. Uh, and it's, I guess the reason for that is I really like classic MMA, and I really like the the style, and especially when you say, what's better, Pride or UFC? I would tell you Pride in a heartbeat, just because aesthetically, not only aesthetically, I, I, I find Pride more pleasing, fighting in a ring. You might say, ah, oh, but the cage, you know, uh, when you fight in a ring, you have to worry about the ropes, and the referee has to come over and get involved and move the fighters, and yeah, that happens, but I think aesthetically watching Pride, it just it looked nicer, and their presentation is just a whole lot better. And yeah, there's some pro wrestling elements into that, but when you were pride at the time and you're, you have 52,000 fans packed into an arena for an event, just the feeling uh, can't be beat. And also, yeah, pride, pride fighting the fights. I think the rule set was better. I I'm not a big fan of the unified rules that they use in the U S uh, I think the Japanese rules where kicks and knees to a downed opponent weren't any more dangerous than elbows uh, in fact, you probably see a lot more cuts in the UFC than you ever did in Pride. Uh, but also, you know, Pride was a product of its of its rule set, which included la yeah. Pal went home. Okay, Daddy's coming out. We're gonna play Super Mario. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pride was there.
they did a test for steroids, and that was that was no big secret. That, that was kind of an open secret. They had produced some awesome looking fighters and some really great matches. And and yeah, you could say that UFC is cleaned up now. Uh, I mean, I guess there's still ways around that, but for the most part, it's a it's a clean sport. I say to hell with it. If they're fighting, you know what? Just let them do what they're gonna do. <laughs> so pride, the pride fights. The what made Pride Fight so great were a combination of things. Not only the rule set, the sort of lackadaisical drug testing, the atmosphere, the look. Uh, to me, it, that's what just makes it so much better. And just to uh, go off on what you say about the look, uh, also just the presentation. Lenny Hart uh, calling out the names oh, of the yeah. fighters, the yeah. entrances. That's the one thing about the UFC. And, you know, I watch UFC, and it is the number one, but there's just something so sterile. And just, it's not, it has a very, it's it's, very, it's like, if you ever watch WWE now, it's almost like the same thing. It's just. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, just, it's, just, it's uh, missing that oomph. That oomph where you feel yeah. like you're watching something that, that, that goes beyond Absolutely. the pale. You know, speaking of that, you watch WWE now, and they have, before the. Before the first scene of the wrestling show even starts, they have like a minute, they have like a minute, 30 seconds of self filating advertising bullshit, you know, with the then, now, forever. And then they have the intro with the music that they've licensed. And then when you finally get to the arena, uh, uh, somebody comes out and they talk for 15 minutes. Now compare that with a Raw from the Attitude Era. You know, that music hits you. It's about 20 seconds long. Uh, just a short little intro, and then you go right to the arena, fireworks, and crazy shit is happening. The big difference in, in presentation, which is why I think uh, uh, WWE is in the shitter now compared to how it used to be. It's not only it's only stars, and it's content, and it's how you present that content. And they've made it, again, like a streamlined sort of corporate version of pro wrestling. Uh, but yeah, also with UFC, you just look at how Pride Fighting Championships would end the fights. Like when a guy won... It was straight to Lenny Hart getting on the mic, screaming the guy's name. He's celebrating. Streamers come down. Crazy stuff is happening. There's just so much emotion and excitement. And Pride, at the end, when a, a fight is finished by TKO, knockout, or submission, and even a decision was like, they bring the guys out to the center of the ring, the lights go down. It's very dramatic. And UFC, just when... That, that's how I would uh, say a big comparison. Just look at, I, I posted a, a clip on my uh, Twitter recently of Vanderlei Silva winning a fight and just how exciting it was when he won. You know, it's it's like night and day between how when a finish comes in the UFC, it just sort of happens and then and then that's it. You know, the crowd might go crazy. But, you know, in ring, it's just like kind of, ugh, it's, it's done, it's over, which uh, pride it was a big deal. They made it a huge deal when somebody finished a fight. And also, I'm just going to add as well, uh, quickly before I give you the final word, uh, the, the audience as well. When you watch the Pride audience, and like when they when Sakuraba would go to the ground, you could just hear the hear them getting excited and all that stuff. Problem is with the modern, I think the modern UFC fan right now is that is there a lack of knowledge about the just the sport in general? They just know the knockout. They don't know the intricacies of going to the ground and all that stuff. And when it seems, whenever a fight goes to the ground, you can just hear the audience just go like, "Ugh, really? Keep it standing." Yeah, and I, I think a part of that has to do with the cage too. It's hard to see when they're on the ground and they're up right against the cage. You can't really see what's going on. Uh, that's why I like I like the big wide ring. You can see everything that's happening. And in Japan, there was a a, a greater appreciation, and I think that had to do with just like the shoot style pro wrestling is it was an art form, and they viewed it as that, and when guys were on the ground grappling, even if the fight was boring, the Japanese fan was courteous enough not to, to, to shit on it. Though sometimes you would hear a, a whistle every now and then, but for the most part, when you had two professionals on the mat in Japan fighting and grappling, the crowd was into it, like super into it. And yeah, that is missing in, in American MMA. Now, I don't want, now, your kids are wanting to play Super Mario. I'm not going to take that away from them, but I just want to give you the final <laughs> final word. Um, yeah, just uh, plug uh, your YouTube channel, uh, uh, the uh, social media that you run, Discord, everything, anything else you want to promote, uh, Most Dangerous Man Alive today. Yeah, 
also, you can check us out on, on YouTube. Just search for Pride Resurrection in the search bar. I guarantee you, you won't find some gay porno. If it's going to be us, that'll be us. Even though the, our profile picture might look like Sakuraba is blowing, uh, Alan goes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a spoof. Um, uh, we're also on BitChute. If you want to check us out there, just search for Pride Resurrection on, on Twitter, at Pride Res, R-E-Z. Uh, and yeah, and you, if you want to join our Discord, uh, I don't know how to how to tell you guys to find the Discord. <laughs> Just go to our Twitter and ask us, and you can come on our Discord. Now, do you when you do the shows live? Do you do them on Twitch or is that YouTube or? Uh, we'll do them on YouTube, and I usually announce them a, a day prior, uh, a couple days prior. Sometimes uh, you'll you'll see that there's a so a show scheduled uh, to take place. But yeah, that all happens on YouTube, which unfortunately I'd like to be able to kick the YouTube habit, but. You know, what are you going to do? No, of, course, of course, of course. Well, uh, Most Dangerous Man Alive, thank you so much for talking to us. I love the channel. I love what you're doing. I wish, you know, there was some sort of archive or something that wasn't behind a paywall to watch these shows. But you're the only guy who's doing it. And thank you uh, for taking time to talk to us about uh, the channel. And, yeah, looking forward to the next show that you do. Um, Pride, MMA Oddies, whatever it will be. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh Take care. Uh, this has been awesome. Yeah, no problem. Stay safe, be healthy, and enjoy uh, Super Mario. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Take care.